Well, um, good morning or good afternoon, depending on when you're watching this podcast. Uh, my name again is uh, Tim Cote, and I am Professor of Regulatory Practice at the Keck Graduate Institute. Today we're going to do Lecture 3, The Philosophy of Food and Drug Law, again utilizing our book, um, The Practical Guide to Food Food and Drug Law and Regulation, 3rd Edition, um, from Pina and Pines, um, uh, put out by Feldy, the Food and Drug Law Institute. So, chapter three is more philosophical. Chapter two went into the nuts and bolts of how the laws are structured and the history of how they came into being. Um, and uh, chapter three talks a little bit more about the means of, by which the FDA works and how that has changed. Uh, it's, it's philosophy of being over time, if you will. The first thing the chapter opens up with is the fact that food and drug law is about physical things. It's about tangible objects in the real world. Um, the Food and Drug uh, and Cosmetic Act itself from 1938 is structured into uh, the types of products, a section for foods, a section for drugs, a section for medical devices. Um, and FDA itself is structured in that same way, according to various products, uh, real tangible objects. Um, this continues, though. When FDA goes to court, the defendant isn't the owner of the thing. The defendant is the thing. It's actually the thing is the, is, is the violative um, being, if you will, of, um, uh, of the court case. So owners can enter into lawsuits to defend um, uh, that thing on the behalf of it, but they don't, uh, if they don't, then the product is condemned or destroyed. Um, so the actions are taken against the, the thing. So um, the focus is always on things. Uh, FDA seeks to protect the public from the thing and or mm, offer to the public the benefits of the thing. So that's how food and drug regulation is structured. Um, <clears throat> now, recall is one of the most common... Ooh, uh, one of the most common activities of uh, the FDA, one of the most commative enforcement actions. Recall is usually voluntary. Um, we call it voluntary because there's not a force of law in most instances in which a recall has occurred, either by FDA or USDA for violative meats. Um, that recall is um, <clears throat> strongly recommended by the FDA or the USDA and for foods, and companies know that it would be extremely poor form and uh, contrary to the commercial interests to uh, fight a um, FDA recommended recall that goes public. Um, so uh, recall is the most common um, action that FDA or USDA for, for meats takes, but um, even though it's involuntary when the agency says you should recall mm, 3,000 lots, uh, or doses of this drug, um, companies are wisely reticent to oppose such um, recommendations. So, um, however, sometimes these voluntary acts are not enough, and particularly in the event of um, criminal procedures, the Department of Justice is often uh, sought to um, uh, move um, actions through injunctions or punishments uh, of companies or individuals through either criminal or, or civil proceedings. Um, the major, major judicial remedies are seizure, injunction, and criminal prosecution. Uh, products are legally seized by U.S. Marshals, uh, as directed by the Department of Justice um, when initiated by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, they are released only if a claimant appears and the government fails to persuade the court that the products are violative of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, it may be a misdemeanor if it were a criminal case. So there are two kinds of, of criminal cases. Misdemeanors, which are defined as court cases that result in a, um, could result, excuse me, could result in a fine up to, but less than, one year in, in prison and felonies, which are court cases which could result in a fine, excuse me, in a um, court sentence of greater than one year. Now, um, 
the scheme of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the, the law scheme is quite strong. In 1975, the Supreme Court stated in a public decision that the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic, case, uh, Cosmetic Act, quote, imposes not only a duty to seek out and remedy violations uh, when they occur, but also, and primarily, a duty to implement measures that will ensure that violations will not occur. Um, the, requirements, this, the requirements of foresight and vigilance imposed upon responsible corporate agents are beyond question demanding and perhaps onerous. So the court is saying it's okay that they're onerous. Too bad. But they are no more stringent than the public has a right to expect. So the point here is this. <clears throat> FDA is the cop on the beat. Okay? They can run around and they can find all kinds of... Um, mistakes and errors and they can beat people up and, and for that. They can impose negative sanctions. But that is not the philosophy and that's the core of this lecture. So the take-home message today is that rather there, there has been a transition and you'll see that as, as I go into a little bit more detail from being the cop on the beat and trying to beat up particular issues that have gone wrong to establishing systems and establishing requirements that will prevent these bad things from happening in the first place and requiring those um, systems of quality, uh, manufacturing quality, quality in clinical trials, uh, standards that will prevent um, bad things from happening from these articles, these things, these potential helpers and these potential harmers to the population, because that is FDA's mission. There, I can't tell you how many times I've been in meetings with industry where they're reporting, well, FDA is very constipated and its job is to approve drugs and it, um, there's, there are problems with the process and it's not approving drugs uh, quickly enough. Well, the fact of the matter is FDA's job is not to approve drugs. FDA's job is to make good, sound public health decisions. Those public health decisions sometimes are to approve drugs. That is in the public's interest, and other times is not. So um, public protection is what it's all about. Uh, for example, a food additive may be approved only if the sponsor affirmatively shows that there's reasonable certainty that it won't harm the consumer. Um, new drugs and devices must affirmatively show that a product is uh, effective in humans. Reasonable doubts, not the preponderance of evidence, are um, they result in non-approval. So if there are any reasonable doubts, then it results in non-approval. FDA's job is to protect the public. Okay? It's somewhat at odds with commercial interests, which is about making money. Um, you can protect the public <laughs> and make money. Um, and that's the success of the American pharmaceutical industry. And there have been incredible successes. So the, the ones in orphan drugs being ones which I've been honored to, to, be, to be greatly involved in. But, um, but the fact is, the protection of the public is the FDA's main job. That's what we hire them for. So going back to this dichotomy of being the cop on the beat versus establishing systems so that the cop has less work to do. Because frankly, FDA doesn't have enough cops. You know, there, there's no way. Think about it. I mean, there's 11,000 people work for FDA. Probably, mm, I don't know, 4,000 of them are engaged in drugs. One pharmaceutical company can have 150,000 employees working for it. FDA is way outgunned if it wants to just be the cop on the beat going around checking and doing compliance. Um, and yet, that role cannot cease in order for it to. Um, have credibility as an enforcement agency with teeth. So, the 1906, uh, returning to lecture two, the 1906 uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic, Food and Drug Act, Pure Food and Drug Act, um, it didn't require any pre-market approval. Okay? You could still go out and market your drugs, but if um, something went wrong, then the FDA had, um, or its predecessor at the USDA, had um, the power to go and uh, and seize and, and, and take action against the violative product. But it didn't have um, pre-market approval. It didn't have the power to decide, does this even get out there into the marketplace? Um, and the government had to learn about it 
that's the first thing, because we all like to think of the government as uh, omnipotent and ever, om, omniscient, uh, but it isn't. It, does, it doesn't even know about it. So it. It takes a little while to learn about things, and generally speaking, surveillance only de always surveillance always detects fewer than 100% of adverse health events. Always one, fewer than 100%. Sometimes as few as 5% of adverse health events. So surveillance systems are important in such detection. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in post-marketing vigilance. But, um, but it's always a small number and you never know exactly which fraction you're getting. So um, FD, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, in contrast, established pre-marketing review, which is a very different philosophy. It permits an assessment of the risks and the benefits because products come to us with certain benefits and certain risk, and it allowed that deliberative, contemplative space in which an impartial observer, namely the government, although partiality is influenced by politics, and I'll mention that in just a moment, um, can weigh, with regards to the public health, do the risks outweigh the benefits? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? Um, and make decisions based on that. Um, also, if a product is to be used under only specific circumstances, um, that can be specified at the time of a pre-marketing review. Okay? So, uh, let's continue on. An example, a good example of this might be, for example, the use of um, melanin-stimulating hormone. Okay? Melanin-stimulating hormone um, could conceivably have incredible utility among um, people who had um, um, photosensitivity, perhaps with regards to porphyria patients. There's a group of patients with porphyria, and if they go out in even the slightest sunlight, sometimes even just bright inside light, they can have horrible, horrible dermal reactions and suffer an exquisite pain. Melanin-stimulating hormone uh, could, in fact, um, and, and there is some data to show that it, to suggest that it in fact um, is helpful for this small group of people. But if melanin stimulating hormone is put out into the marketplace, and given Americans' proclivity for wanting to be have tans, and you can see that with all the tanning booths along the tanning industry is huge. Given that we know that this is a, a an an era, and for the last 20 years, melanoma has become the fastest rising cancer in our country. I mean, just the rates are screaming upward as um, probably damage to the ozone, increased UV light exposure, and we know that UV light exposure is, is a high rate. Why would one want to release into the public a chemical which um, stimulates the uh, proliferation of a stem cell, of, 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 a, of a cell line that we know is mm, an ex, an ex, a rapidly increasing um, cancer in incidence, the most rapidly increasing, and, and a deadly cancer at that. So these are the kinds of questions. I'm not saying I have the right answer. I'm certainly not going to give an answer here on, on this podcast, but um, that balance, those considerations of public health versus um, individual good that need to be made by an impartial observer who's responsible and, and uh, re re reports to the taxpayers. Um, so there are uh, public health, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, time, the time shift from uh, courts, court actions to administrative tools. So th we've seen this, this shift from 1958 through 1976 where early in the course of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act Court actions were the primary means through which FDA did its business. Now it's more and more through administrative tools such as pre-marketing approval and rulemaking um, regulations, uh, which are ex much, much more efficient than, um, than court decisions because court decisions take a time to build up. Um, judges have to look at the uh, opinions of other judges and build up a body of case law. Um, but uh, rulemaking through regs um, allows a transfer of power from the courts to the FDA. And the courts have allowed this because 
much of the material is highly technical, and courts do extremely poorly with very technical information uh, because they're not staffed up by a concentration of uh, technically trained people. Uh, courts still have the final say in the validity of the regulations. So the way that we've, we are doing business now is much less of direct enforcement, but the promulgation of regulations, which are then um, um, considered by the courts as whether they're valid or not, that is, whether or not they are within the confines of their implementing legislation. Uh, note that the uh, Code of Federal, Re Federal Regulations t Title 21 is where most of these things are found, but there are other regulations in other parts of the CFR um, that relate to a food and drug law. But Title 21 is perhaps the, um, the most solid block of uh, relevant uh, regulations. So in the early years, FDA was chiefly a law enforcement agency. Today, it's a scientific regulatory agency. And you should know that there is a big push uh, by the current uh, commissioner, uh, Dr. Margaret Hamburg, to fund uh, regulatory science, to, um, to strengthen the agency's ability to put regulation in a scientific basis through education, um, through internal training, through, um, through um, uh, the Udall um, Foundation, which uh, the separate think tanks which are able to consider new systems for um, creating uh, science-based uh, regulatory action. <clears throat> this regulatory science screens out unsafe products and establishes manufacturing and labeling and testing requirements, all of which, as the Supreme Court decision uh, noted, are intended to um, prevent things from happening rather than having to um, uh, litigate against them afterwards. Um, so these are principally preventative rather than corrective measures. Um, however, the FDA um, industry um, relationship is always set in the context of politics. This is a democratic institution, a function of a government which is elected by a body politic. And it is palpable within the FDA, usually not so much at the lowest levels where I came in, but certainly at the higher levels when I left, that um, government, depending on whether it's a regu uh, Republican or um, Democrat administration, and sometimes not even so much of that, um, sometimes more influenced by funding patterns of, um, there had been a time in which pharmaceutical, and it's, it still exists, but probably to a lesser degree today than earlier, pharmaceutical companies were the major contributions to political campaigns. And that influences, there is no question that that has influenced the tenor of the agency overall. I'm not saying it influences individual decisions because it certainly does not. Um, the system has enough integrity to prevent that. But the tenor of what is acceptable and what is not is a political decision and probably should be, to tell you the truth, uh, probably should be uh, influenced by the body politic. The questions that come are should it be influenced by um, special interest groups um, that hold special power uh, in, um, in the commerce of industry. And, and that is one that you going forward as professionals need to grapple with. Um, so, there's always a tension uh, between the prevention of harm and the promotion of benefit any time that an application is reviewed. Uh, there is a, a bit of a pendulum theory. We have recently gone through a period in which there's been a um, long history of um, adverse events that were detected post-marketing. So products have come out. Uh, generally speaking, the, um, the preclinical studies that were done were quite sound, did not detect a certain adverse event. But after marketing, rare but very, very serious adverse events were in fact detected, bringing back the question of should this drug have ever been approved to begin with. And in some cases that question is um, only answerable with hindsight, uh, but we expect our government to protect us from these things. So uh, there is this a pendulum theory in that we have just gone through a period in which um, safety considerations 
have had enormous political impact. Moving forward, um, there are questions about how do we assure that um, safety considerations which are small might be appropriately considered in the context of drugs which are effective, um, for which there are no other therapies, for um, rare diseases, say, uh, how do we assure that people can get access to the drugs that they may well need um, in the context of this um, concern uh, and vigilance, and appropriate vigilance, for um, for safety. And so those uh, making that balance has become uh, even more difficult in the context of recent history where we've had um, issues with uh, key tech and um, um, which other ones. Some of the statins have come out. There were non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. There, and, and these hit the news big time. And the agency is uh, quite, um, quite under the gun in the public limelight uh, at that time. The other questions that come up philosophically is whether, uh, what should the relationship between the agency and a regulated industry be? Um, Certainly, the two need to interact carefully when you're talking about the consideration of applications which are highly technical and require clear communication of multiple details in study design. And, and also, you're talking about both parties having an interest, or ostensibly, in the promotion of public health, the, 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 the uh, dealing with the disease. So both parties have that shared interest both the agency and regulated industry. How close do they work? How close can um, the, 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 I don't know, I don't want to say the fox guard the hen house, but the, you want to make sure that they're close enough so that, um, so that appropriate communication can occur and that shared mission in the promotion, where it exists, where there is overlap, that shared mission can be used to the greatest uh, benefit. And yet, there needs to be at arm's length so that the um, regulated industry can recognize that it is regulated, that the uh, system can continue to have integrity and authority and, um, and act in the public's best interest in an unqualified way, always in the public's best interest and never in um, these incidental um, relationships, which can become close if we're not careful. It could become inappropriately close. So that balance, that's another balance that needs to be made um, in uh, moving forward. So <clears throat> um, we want a review process that exemplifies rigor, both in the evaluation of safety and efficacy and overall public health benefit, but it can't unduly delay um, good products. So. Uh, in an early, early in her tenure, uh, Commissioner Hamburg wrote a New England Journal article which stated that the FDA has been accused of only approving products at two speeds, too fast or too slow. And uh, I, one can see how it, um, it um, opens itself up to that kind of criticism. Um, so I did want to make uh, the example that there are trade-offs, the response to HIV during the HIV epidemic early on in the early 80s, mid-80s, uh, even into the early 90s, um, there was an incredible amount of energy that went into antiretroviral research. And uh, the agency responded to the, mostly to the political pressure uh, from AIDS groups, uh, patient advocacy groups that said, look, we need a different system. This was at a time especially bef uh, in the early days of PDUFA uh, that um, prevented it from being well-funded and had a lot of backlog. And I mean, things were um, not working nearly as efficiently as they work today. Um, but the AIDS activists came forward and said, let's uh, look at some other things like uh, viral load as an endpoint, for example rather than overall mortality that sped up um, the process of drug development. And in fact, um, the history of antiretroviral drug development is one of inor inordinate success, moving from a uh, disease that was incredibly, um, you know, it was a death sentence, basically, when back in 81, 82, when I was in medical school, 
If you had HIV, you were going to die, and you were going to die soon. And now, if you have HIV, you have a chronic disease in which not all the numbers are in, but you might even have a normal lifespan for all we know right now, it appears. So, um, uh, they did streamline the process review, and uh, HIV drugs were developed. Uh, I just uh, to mention again that enforcement, FDA is a cop, but there are very few cops, and so uh, the likelihood that we will um, be effective by instituting a pharmacologic police state is very, very small. FDA has to work smarter um, through the other administrative tools that it has now, um, such as regulations. Uh, I do want to mention there's uh, some consideration of the practice of medicine, and this concerns, uh, most pragmatically concerns, the question of off-label use. You know that when a drug is approved, it's approved for a specific indication, but the drug might also uh, have other applications for which it is not yet approved. And especially in rare diseases, many drugs are used what's called off-label. That's for an indication other than the indication which is on the label. So if drug use is off-label, um, that, uh, that is not illegal. Any physician can go forward and uh, um, prescribe a drug off-label. There are rules that the manufacturer cannot um, promote the drug for the off-label use. It can't, and, and those laws have become more and more intricate over time as it's gone forward. But um, you should know that most the practice of medicine is generally regulated by the state. So I hold a state, I hold a license by the state of Maryland authorizing me um, as, quote, physician and surgeon, believe it or not, because that's the formal legal title. I'm not a surgeon. I've, I don't cut people open, other than in the context of pathology, when it doesn't matter. But at any rate, the point is that um, the practice of medicine is regulated by the states. It's not regulated by the FDA. Off-label use is, in fact, um, uh, permitted. In many cases, most companies can get most of their revenues. In, in, I'm sorry. In many cases, many companies get most of their revenues from particular drugs from off-label use, not from the label, the use for which it is labeled. So, um, uh, this is really sticky business. We do know that the best way to assure availability is through uh, approved uses, because third-party payers often are unwilling to pay for. Uh, drugs that are used off-label. It's considered investigational. Um, so FDA regulations do, however, bear upon the conduct of clinical trials, which could be considered the practice of medicine. Um, but clinical trials are a grand experiment, if you will, in whether or not a drug works. And if the uh, clinician is, in this point, uh, the investigator, the researcher, then the conduct of those trials has to occur under what's called GCP, or good clinical practice, uh, in order for um, the results of that investigational new drug exempt, that, that study conducted under IND exemption um, is considered for, um, for uh, marketing approval. So uh, there are rules which regulate clinicians in that context, but otherwise, just in the vanilla treating of sick people, um, the regulation of medicine is not regulated by the FDA. Um, <clears throat> so there are approvals for, as I mentioned, approvals for specific indication, but there's a lot of off-label use. Um, uh, they are not allowed, uh, companies are not allowed to promote for off-label use. Lately, they've been allowed to uh, issue uh, articles from the medical literature uh, in part of their drug detailing issue. This has been considered a question of, uh, of freedom of speech, which I should introduce to you, those of you who are foreign born. Uh, freedom of speech, that whole concept comes from the first uh, amendment uh, to the Constitution, the first being the first of ten that is included in what we call the Bill of Rights. Um, and that's where the freedom of speech, assembly, press, um, and several others are included. Um, okay, they're talking more, a little bit more about the philosophy of drug regulation. There has been a shift over the past couple of decades towards increasing responsibility for consumers. Uh, the use of over-the-counter uh, products implicitly 
requires the, res the loci of responsibility not to be with the physician, the prescribing physician, but with the patient themselves who just walks into a drugstore and buys stuff. And so there is an increasing consideration of that in part because this makes drugs much less expensive to the patient. Um, so if it, all other things being okay, such as safety and appropriateness of use, there's been increasing use of over-the-counter products and patients uh, prefer that. So again, this is a democracy that people are supposed to rule here. Um, there has also been um, an increasing deployment of direct-to-consumer advertising. When I started um, many years ago, there was virtually no direct-to-consumer advertising on TV. A large share of TV advertising now is advertising of particular drug products uh, recommending patients go into um, their physicians and ask about particular drugs. Um, there are differing opinions on this, and um, we should have a classroom discussion about it. We should make this part of our discussion. To what extent should patients be um, educated? Drug companies, we have freedom of speech here. They can say what they want to. Patients want to be educated. This is a source of new information about new products. To what extent do they have that right? And to what extent um, can that be misleading um, for individual companies' personal profits. And perhaps um, the old systems that we had, where there was no direct-to-consumer advertising because it was impractical. I mean, they used to require going over all of, the, uh, all of the adverse events in the label, and that just didn't work. Now we have lots of direct-to-consumer advertising. We should talk about that a little bit in the discussion component. Okay, so um, FDA is an accountable agency. It's accountable to people at many different levels. It has uh, several different bosses. The first boss is, of course, Health and Human Services, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and the Office of Management and Budget, both of which are in the executive branch of government. So the direct report of Margaret Hamburg is... Um, starts with an S. I'm losing it. Okay, so I, I know this. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you do a live podcast. You forget things that you... Sibelius, Catherine Sibelius, who is the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And, um, and that's whom she reports to directly. But the Office of Management and Budget also oversees her, her actions within the, um, within the executive branch. Uh, FDA also has oversight by Congress, since Congress is footing the bill. They're the ones paying for it. Um, they're the ones who give it enabling legislation. There are, as I mentioned, the Senate and the House. So in the Senate, it's the, the HELP Committee, which is an acronym that stands for Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. That's in um, the Senate uh, uh, the committee that oversees FDA's actions. And in the House, it's the um, Committee on Energy and Commerce. Uh, either of those two bodies often will have uh, hearings about particular aspects of uh, FDA operations. And they can make a lot of public um, display in that case, and they can have deliberative actions which could result in new legislation. Uh, because FDA is uh, originated historically within the USDA, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, the appropriations, appropriations means how it gets money to fund itself each year, are determined by the agriculture subcommittees. So that's where it gets um, money from is other committees still. It is overseen by the courts, which determine, especially in enforcement programs, whether or not the regulations are valid and constitutional. Um, it's also accountable to the scientific and medical community through publications, and um, those communities weigh heavily upon FDA's actions. Uh, there are advisory committees, which FDA sets up on a, um, uh, on a regular basis, probably... I don't know, just, just fancying a guess, there may be as many as 50 advisory committees that advise FDA on particular actions, specific actions, as to whether particular drugs should or should not be um, approved for marketing. Uh, those advisory committees are constituted from a collection of non-conflicted advisors from the medical community that FDA seeks out and brings together and asks to vote, specifically to vote, and their votes are published. Um, advisory committee meetings are covered like a three-ring circus. There are people from Wall Street, there are cameras rolling, um, there are patient groups who come in, and everybody has a place to speak in these public forums, many of which deal with whether or not to approve or to not approve a particular drug. Um, 
the FDA is not beholden to take the uh, recommendation of those advisory committees. However, it almost always does. Almost always. Uh, an important exemption recently was with uh, Plan B, for example. This is the um, morning after contraception, which was during the Bush administration, um, recommended by the advisory committee, by an over overwhelming uh, majority. But in that particular context of that um, Republican administration, it was not a viable political uh, choice. And so even though the science and the public health were very sound, um, the FDA did not take action in that particular, and that's an example of how it doesn't have to follow its advisory committee. But the advisory committees, um, uh, their deliberations are considered uh, very, very important to the drug approval process. Um, so, um, FDA is also accountable to public opinion. Every week you will hear something on the news, if you listen to it at all, that involves the Food and Drug Administration. But with regards to the review of products, of individual products, it is not accountable to public opinion because most of the information that it deals with is commercially sensitive. It's a tra they're trade secrets. It's highly technical. Um, and that information is proprietary. It belongs to the people who submitted it in. This causes FDA incredible grief because in the court of public opinion, it is always going to lose. The reason it loses is because manufacturers who purport to be bringing forth a new drug for great good, there may be problems, there are always some problems, with that drug that FDA cannot speak about publicly. The companies can go on and on about how they're being just such obstructionists over there in the government, but the, but the agency cannot say, well, this is the problem with this drug, is this manufacturing issue, or that um, adverse event, or whatever the problems are. The FDA has its hands tied behind its back because the information which has been given to it, which it has seeked out, is proprietary, and it cannot publicly discuss any of those matters. So it can be look, made to look extremely bad in the court of public opinion when those arguments are unbalanced. Uh, it also looks bad with foodborne outbreaks. Whenever there's a foodborne outbreak, which may be a result of the kinds of systems that we have constructed in order to um, create food, systems which are increasingly concentrated so that uh, the provision of food is extraordinarily economical. It costs less to feed an American today than it did 20 or 40 or 100 years ago. Far, far less. I mean, it used to be that Food was a large proportion of the average American's uh, budget. Now it is a very small proportion. Uh, abundance of good, safe food is part of the hallmark of uh, American success. And yet, when things go bad in a concentrated system, they go very, very bad. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people can get sick. So whenever uh, food uh, goes bad and there's a foodborne outbreak, FDA comes under incredible amount of fire. Uh, I just want to take only a moment to discuss international issues. Um, within the last few years, uh, FDA has always had a role, going way, way back to the um, regulation of imported products. But what has happened now, especially with regards to China and India, is an increase in the number of line items of imported products, which has far, far outstripped FDA's resources to be able to be even a cop, not only a cop um, inspecting all of these things, but even a good implementer of these administrative regulatory tools, which can handle, um, which can provide for an assurance that imported products are indeed all safe. Um, the ratio of, of um, regulatory um, insurance to the, to the deluge of products that's coming in just because of the way that the marketplace is working, it has far outstripped the agency. And so there's um, incredible problems. But now FDA has uh, a number of uh, FDA offices overseas. Uh, I think there are three in China and at least two in, um, in India, if not more, that uh, at least provide a window for FDA's regulatory uh, actions in country in the context of a U.S. foreign mission at the embassy. So, um, 
the another issue that has come up that you'll hear more and more about is 9/11 changed everything they say and uh, bioterrorism and medical countermeasures the provision of new products which can uh, counteract um, envisioned bioterrorist weapons has become a major focus of FDA um, action so project bioshield you heard about in the last um, in the last lecture and there have been others but uh, some of this, some argue, is paranoia. M some of this is very real. Uh, it's an empiric question, and one must do the experiment. We are all part of that experiment, uh, and we, uh, we do know, however, that it is an increasing concern and uh, an expanding endeavor of, um, of the American pharmaceutical company is looking at this question of uh, what kinds of bioterrorist, biological bioterrorist actions could we anticipate and how can we uh, produce products which can appropriately respond to it. Uh, lastly, or almost lastly, yes, lastly I do want to mention this philosophical question of how FDA gets funded because that has undergone a shift. Again, the um, PDUFA, the Prescription Drug Users Fee Act, um, prescribed a new system recognizing that FDA was sort of um, administratively constipated in its review of products to say, okay, um, the pharmaceutical company will come forward and will negotiate as a whole with the agency to establish what certain fees should be and they would expect certain outputs, fees for, you know, if you put in a licensing application, you want your drug to be um, reviewed for marketing. What, what should that fee be for, for the or review of that application, not, not for buying the application and getting a positive determination, but for just deciding. <laughs> and what should the clock be for that? How long should it take for people to do that review? So a whole system of a timetables of you have to have the review done by a certain day, you have to have all of these things by certain dates has increased the efficiency of the FDA and it's also been increased by the fact that now there are new resources from these fees, and these fees came directly into buying new res researchers, uh, uh, reviewers. But um, the problem with all of this is that the regulators are now paid for by the regulated. So does that introduce an element of bias when your paycheck is coming from the people who make money by you giving them a uh, yes answer? Important philosophical question. I think that the history so far um, would speak against that, that uh, FDA is populated by dedicated public servants who um, do their damnedest to protect the public health and do a good job of it um, and are not assuaged to go one way or the other. And these decisions are usually made at the level of the individual reviewers, which is where most of the power should be, the, um, the team of reviewers, actually, because it takes multiple disciplines, from farm talks to biostatistics to clinical pharmacology um, to medical officers. It takes a, a dimensional team to review a drug. And then, of course, all of that being integrated in the person of the review division director who um, can speak to all of those opinions and synthesize that information into a final decision as to what the review division should do. I think that those people are uninfluenced. It's my personal opinion that they are uninfluenced by PDUFA money, that the agency as a whole is receiving and that is funding all of those people's work. Um, at the same point, one could argue that in a pure system, the people who are being protected by such, um, by, by the actions of their public stewards, uh, their stewards of public funds and their, 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 their public servants, they've been protected, should be paying for those public servants. The reality is that um, in the current uh, economic context of government, the government is deeply in debt and doesn't want to pay more money for such reviewers. So this is the system that we have right now where uh, reviewers are paid for by the reviewed. Um, and that's just how it is. If somebody can come up with a better system, I'd like to hear a little bit about that. We should talk about this philosophy as well in our next class discussion.
And with that, we conclude Lecture 3. Uh, I look forward very much to uh, talking to you all on the, uh, in the public discussion, seeing the first of the, uh, the guidance reviews that are coming up. And uh, I wish you all uh, a good night and, or good morning, whichever you're at. And we will see you in Lecture 4. Take care.